Final Fantasy XI is one of the most rewarding games I've ever played, but the depth that gives it that feeling can also make it a tad hard to get into. In this video, I'll be going through a rundown of all the useful info a new player or someone revisiting after a long hiatus might need to know. So hey guys, it's Hunt for Games, bringing you a healthy mix of videos on new releases and MMOs, and nostalgia trips to the classics that made us fall in love with games in the first place. And Eleven was definitely one of those games, but it's changed a lot over the years. Let's get right into a high level look at some of those changes as a jumping off point for getting a rolling again in Banna Deal. So we've also got Hayden here, let's get right into it with some logistical details about stuff dealing with the game. So first off, there's still a subscription fee. Nothing has changed about that in the 15, 16 years of this game's life. I, for one, and players that are still playing think that it's worth it. It's helped keep the community a tight-knit and engaged community. Anybody playing this game definitely wants to play it, but be aware of that as you come in. Uh, there is, or I should say, was a free trial available that would last 14 days. Uh, unfortunately, the other day, as of the time of filming this video, Square Enix ran out of free trial keys. I certainly hope that they're going to replenish those shortly, but no way to know for sure. All right, so World Pass is very useful. It's essentially how you um, connect to a friend's server if you want to make a new character or you want to transition from one server to another. Let's say you maybe your old server you were on has closed or you're a new player and you want to join a friend who's really into the game. Um, your friend in the game can go to a vendor in Vanadiel and for, I think, a very low price, it's like 5,000 gil maybe or less, purchase a world pass they will provide you with that code, and then when you create your character for the first time, you'll enter that code, and it will guarantee that you will be slotted into their server. And it also comes along with a number of um, benefits that are generated after you play for a long period of time, I believe, for both you and the person um, who provided you with the World Pass. So it's a pretty cool system. It's very simple. It does require a little bit of in-game uh, investment, but it's, it's super minimal. The play online system, if you remember it, is still in place. That's the tool that you log into to then get access to Final Fantasy XI. Uh, you will need a play online ID if you've ever played before to get access to your old character. If you can't remember, reach out to Square Enix. They might be able to help you find it or, or gain access to it again. Play online can be downloaded from Square Enix's Play Online Final Fantasy XI website. Or if you have a Steam key, you can just get the game straight from Steam. Uh, it is still PC only, I should say, not still. The PS2 and Xbox 360 versions of the game, unfortunately, have been shut down. It was all the same server, though, so if you've never played on PC but did play on PS2 or Xbox 360, you should be able to access your old character as long as you still have all of your account details. They have added in a bunch of uh, useful features in terms of macro cloud saving, along with the equip sets that we'll get into a little bit. You can now upload and download those macros from um, Final Fantasy XI servers. Unfortunately, if you didn't do that before logging out for the last time <laughs> last time you played, you probably have to rewrite them again now. But it is a useful feature moving forward, especially if you hop in between multiple computers. Um, I will note that unfortunately, the cloud sync is quite nice that it exists. However, it is very basic in the sense that it is a manual sync. So you are required to remember, let's say you're playing on your home computer and then you're gonna be playing on a laptop somewhere else the next day. You've gotta remember before you log off of your home computer to go into the character selection menu, upload your macro data to the server slot. Then when you go to your laptop the next day, you have to remember to download it. So it's not like it syncs automatically. Uh, you have to manually do that. Just keep yeah. that in mind. So it's super nice compared to what it used to be where we had to find the files on our PCs or wherever and then like copy them over and it was super annoying, but it's still not quite fully automatic. But that's pretty much it for now for logistical details. Let's get into a little bit about the fundamentals of the game just as a refresher for returning players or as a kickstarting point for new players. Uh, job fundamentals, there are 22 jobs in Final Fantasy XI. Six base jobs that you start off with. Uh, let's see, I think it's Monk, pal <laughs> Paladin, not Paladin. Monk, Warrior, White Mage, Black Mage, Red Mage, and Thief. And at level, once you get one of these jobs to level 30, you can start doing the next 14 job quests. Uh, that's everything from Paladin through Scholar, if you're looking at the list I've got up on screen. Geomancer and Rune Fencer uh, can't be obtained, I believe, until the Adelin Story Quest, which is the latest expansion, the final expansion mm -hmm. that was released for Final Fantasy XI. Um, but you'll have plenty to work on before getting there anyway. 
There's also a, a sub job system. Once you get a single job to level 18, there is a quest in Maura or Selbina to two towns in Final Fantasy XI that can kick off your support job quest. Uh, once you've completed that quest, which is, I still think, just a few few items that you have to obtain from nearby um, monsters, you are able to sub a job to your main job, which will always be half the level of your main job. Um, if you're planning on having a support job last you from 1 to 99, you would need to get a support job up to level 49. Uh, it has all the abilities, traits, spells, what have you, that you could have on that job at that level. Uh, the only caveat being you don't have access to its two hour, which is every job's most powerful ability that can only be used once every two hours. For new players, support job system is really amazing. It's one of my favorite parts of Final Fantasy XI. It's a piece of the game that I think is super unique that a lot of MMOs don't have. Um, the way it's very strict in the sense that whatever your support job has, you get allows for really interesting synergies, really weird combinations of uh, main job, support job, and it just is super, super, super fun. Um, additionally, this game is also unlike maybe WoW, I guess is a good example since it's so popular. WoW is sort of a, you might have a character locked to a class and you have multiple characters. Final Fantasy XI is sort of focused, you can have multiple characters, but most people tend to have one character they focus on and then level up as many jobs as they want for that character. So that's also nice. I just like that system. It's more enjoyable for me. I get to keep my one character and just punch away on as many jobs as I want all the time and just change around stuff and mix it and match. And it's a super fun system. Definitely. And you should definitely try mixing and matching different support jobs. They offer different enhancements and benefits to main jobs and all have different, um, strengths and weaknesses. I could support, <laughs> support, I could suggest support jobs that in general are, are as far as I see it stronger than others. But honestly, one of the best aspects of the system is, is trying combinations you think might not be any good. And, and Final Fantasy XI is amazing at allowing you to try combinations and strategies that even the developers never thought would be successful and I, I don't want to halt any of that kind of exploration because there are still amazing mm -hmm. techniques and, and strategies that people probably haven't even tried yet that could be very very successful so just go for it so moving on we'll check out uh, <clears throat> the new level cap and, and leveling speed uh, if you were here in the level 75 cap era days there is a new level cap now of 99 with five new limit break quests to get you to that that new max tier um, at 99, gear level actually can range from just straight up 99 gear to eye level 109, 119, 119 being the cap. Um, mm -hmm. From there, there's just different tiers of strength through the 119 gear, but that's really sort of your end game goal for getting to a point at which you're, I don't know, I'm kind of rambling now, but not, not competitive, but able to engage in, in some of the more interesting end game activities but that's kind of a ways off if you're looking at those numbers and saying uh, final fantasy 11 leveling takes forever i will never be able to get from 75 to 99 or from 1 to 99 leveling speed has increased dramatically um yes. with the introduction of the rhapsodies of vanadio missions which we'll get into in a little bit uh there are bonuses to how much experience you gain Lower level monsters now give more experience than they used to, all of which adds up to a, a much faster leveling speed than most players are used to. In addition, uh, there's a new trust system, which again, we'll go into a little more detail in a minute, but that allows you to pull in other, other party members and essentially have a full party whether or not real players are available or not. You'll fly through the levels. Um, there's no concern that you, you won't be able to reach 99 in, in a standard amount of time. It's it's much faster now. Uh, there is a new endgame grind known as capacity points, which in turn earn you job points. Uh, these drastically increase your character strength, but aren't something, again, that you have to worry about until well after you're 99 and have spent some time acquiring decent gear. We'll get into a little more detail with that later, but just know that the system's out there and it's, it's pretty cool. 
Yeah, Square Enix has added a lot despite this game um, not having an, an actual official expansion pack since uh, 2013, I want to say. Um, they've done a lot over the last five years in just content updates and various things to add longevity to the to the game. And it's it's really fun. All these systems are really cool. They're really worth investing time in. And like Hunter said, um, getting even from 1 to 99 is not only fun, but it's way more reasonable compared to the time it took years and years ago. So definitely recommend giving it a shot. Moving on, let's talk a little bit about teleportation and travel. Uh, anybody who's familiar with Final Fantasy XI, even in passing, has probably heard that travel in this game can be a bit of a pain. It's almost uh, painful to a fault, but there have been an increasing number of, of tools and systems added that allow you to traverse Vanadil a little bit more smoothly. So they have added a lot to teleportation and travel in Final Fantasy XI now. And this is a game-changing element. Massively improved time efficiency as a player. I know that it's nostalgic to think about running through Rollingberry Fields, and I loved that time, but I've gotten older, don't have as much time. I like to get into games and just get going, and Final Fantasy XI has really embraced that, um, that kind of play style. Um, the, the most significant change, I think, is... The home point crystals now act as warp points. So as you travel through Bonadiel, whether you're returning or you're a brand new player, make sure you click on every one of these blue crystals you come across because they used to act as just a way to return to this spot if you died out in the field. You'd be warped back to whichever one you'd selected as your home point. But now they act as travel points where you can connect to any other home point you've, you've actually gone and clicked on in the world. But that's a key point. You do have to go out once and click on the home point. So I highly recommend that first time you traverse out in the world to go get the home point you you ride your favorite jacobo or your favorite mount and you just enjoy the zone music and then grab that home point and then, and then continue to use it in the future when you want to get back out there really quickly um there's still of course the outpost warping and teleport spells but they're just not used as frequently unless there's a really specific area you have to go to where there is not a home point crystal but square Enix has gone through and added home point crystals to a lot of really convenient spots that players are frequenting nowadays with the different uh, battlefields and missions that are available um survival guides has been that has been around a little while but if you don't know what it is there are books inside various dungeons they tend to be in um there are survival guides in towns as well and you can use wow did you just you totally just teleported out just that teleported right. us out just teleported just us out. It. but the survival, <laughs> survival guides are a great way to quickly get out into like mace shikrami or some of those older zones that you may not go to very often um and there's also instances where you're you're going to use them um just for for getting around uh also the unity system which we'll talk about later in more detail but basically there's an npc who handles unity and uh warping and they can take you to a lot of the areas right away you don't even have to do anything you just talk to them and then they'll have a list of like um different areas you can go to uh, and most of those are are really nice some of those like La face meadows some places that used to take quite a while to get to you can now just be warped through the unity npc there's also now a summonable mount system a uh, quest in upper juno at the chocobo stables will allow you to start collecting mounts which can be used almost anywhere uh, while you can still use the chocobo stables that are at the exit of each city and at the teleport crags uh, and I highly encourage them for nostalgic value and that amazing chocobo music. You can use the mount system to summon a mount wherever you happen to be throughout most zones uh, in Vanadil. It's pretty handy. I have to admit it's been pretty fantastic. You can continue to collect more mounts. They're all exactly the same in terms of speed, but um, some obviously look a little more ridiculous than others, and they're, they are fun to collect. On top of that, base movement speed is now in general just like a lot faster. Uh, various updates through the years have slowly increased that value to what it is today. Uh, it may not be noticeable looking at it if you've never seen the old movement speed, but it did used to be a lot slower, and this has made just general navigation throughout the world a lot, a lot faster and easier. Uh, next, let's get into some inventory and equipment stuff. So first up, gear swapping. Um, Final Fantasy XI is a game centered around the concept of having 
not only just one amazing set of gear, but multiple pieces of gear that you'd use per action on a, a single job. Uh, some people have entire sets devoted to one weapon skill, one ability, one magic spell. Gear swapping has always been pretty prevalent in Final Fantasy XI through the use of macros, even in-game. But now, through the use of full equip sets, it's been made much simpler. So they've introduced the equip set system. It's under your, your macro system, and you can input entire sets of equipment for whatever action you may, may be performing. You can see Hayden over there swapping between multiple crazy gear sets. Uh, this allows really macro creation to be a lot simpler than it used to be for anybody that remembers the pains of, of putting together complicated equip set macros and then only to lose those macros later. Now you can just equip directly the full, the full set instead of gear by gear. Um, this means that more so than ever, the amount of inventory space that that gear takes up is pretty significant. Luckily, we've had plenty of changes to the inventory system. Um, there are so much more space, it's, it's hard to even believe. We now have an extra mock safe tied to the size of the original mock safe. Obviously, the storage is still in place based on how many items you have in, in your mock house. The mock locker is still available but the Mog Satchel may be new depending on when you were last here. Uh, that's accessible, except, <laughs> it's accessible <laughs> anywhere in the world. Mog Sack also, the Mog Case also. The Mog <laughs> Wardrobe and Wardrobe 2 are accessible anywhere and also can be, you can equip items from them. So if you have something in your, say your um, equip set that is actually stored in the Mog Wardrobe 1 through 4, you can equip it directly out of that slot, so you don't have to swap it back into your inventory, which is incredibly handy for people that are playing on multiple jobs and have numerous gear sets. If it, you're only really working on one job for now, or only have one set of gear, not something to worry about for now, but but keep it in mind for later. The Mog Drobe, Wardrobe 3 and 4 um, are actually an extra benefit that you have to pay for. I, I forget exactly how much you have to pay for. It might be two two or three dollars, something like that. Yeah, I think it's like two or three a month, yeah. Um, totally worth it once you get to a point if, if you're playing consistently and you've got, like I said, multiple jobs that you play often and you just don't really feel like moving gear in and out of inventory anymore. But if you're just coming back and you really only have one job that you're working on, probably not something you need to worry about for a little while. The Gobby Bag Quest, uh, if, if you are unfamiliar or, or forget, when you first enter the game, your inventory is limited to, I think, 50, maybe even lower. Um, by doing quests from uh, Happy Little Goblin, you can raise that all the way up to 80 now. I um, think there are six of those quests, maybe more. I can't really remember. Regardless. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> I don't remember the exact number, but it's not it's not too bad nowadays because a lot of those items that you needed for the Dobby Bag quests have become much, much cheaper. Um, and easier to come by, so it's just a pretty easy process now to, to upgrade those, and it's worth doing. But again, it's not something you need to jump into the game and do right away. The, the amount of stuff they've added as a new player, um, there's so much extra storage that you really don't have to worry about upgrading your inventory right off the bat, um, unless you really want to. Um, but also, just wanted to mention, if you're a returning player who remembers the days of going to change your job and having to go into your mock house, and just sit there like clicking over and over and over again to try to get gear to switch between inventories. Um, the Mog Wardrobes solve that problem. They are great. You just put what you want in there and then you can equip things directly from there as if they're in your inventory on your character. However, we'll note that the Mog Wardrobes only carry gear. So you can't put items or consumables or food or anything in there. It's just gear items. That includes weapons, of course, but... Um, if, it, if you can't equip it on your person, it won't go into the, the mod wardrobe. So now let's get into a little bit about UI changes. Um, there's obviously a lot of differences to the UI. One of the first ones that's easily noticeable as you start fighting, TP has been changed a little bit. It used to be that you go from 100 TP to 203 P and then, uh, what did I say? 203 TP, oh my God, why can't I say this? 200 TP, 300 TP. Now it's uh, marked by the thousands. It, it's really the same exact system. You can just see those kind of fractional values now a little bit easier because it's a full digit. 
Um, also, your status effects and, and abilities, all you can turn on a system to show the remaining timer left on, on how long you have left on those buffs. So like I just engaged Hasso and I have five minutes left on, on the Hasso buff. That is in the miscellaneous three. If you go into config, miscellaneous three, timer display on. Um, it's really handy for understanding how long your buffs are actually gonna last. The status icon changes are also in here. So it displays basically, anyone you highlight, you can see their status effects. Um, yep, down the left hand corner so there. You, it's down the left hand corner. Now another, another little top tip for that, if you're a healer, let's say, and you highlight someone in your party and then click the party menu and then go down to a new feature called uh, focus you can select a party member to be your focus target and then their their status effects will remain above your uh window down there regardless of if you select another person in the party so let's say you're a white mage and there's a paladin and you're doing an event or something you can focus that paladin and see what status effects they have so you can quickly do nah spells to, to heal them up. Where is that? <laughs> uh, if you go to party from the, the main menu there and then go down to the... the oh my gosh. Yeah. Who knew? I knew. No one knew. <laughs> if, if only somebody had known this. Nobody knew this. <laughs> so the disadvantage of it is you do, if, if you are a healer, like I said, you, you know, I play White Mage, so I'm familiar with this, this process. That The give and take of it is you, you then can't see the status effects of anyone else until you turn off party focus manually. So it is a little mm. bit of a give and take there. Um, again, in very specific situations, I'll use that if there's one, you know, tank that, I, that I'm in a party with in an alliance and I have to heal them. And the only thing that really matters is that they stay safe. Then I'll, uh, I'll do that just to be extra, extra on top of things. That's awesome. There's also the area display option. Now, if you're using, I wish I had, I wish I was a magic user. Um, <laughs> if you if you turn that configuration on, whenever you cast magic from your actual menu, it'll now show you an area of effect ring of, of how large the area is that that spell will affect. Uh, the only downside to this is it doesn't work if you're using those spells from macros, so it's only if you actually go down through the magic menu system, but still pretty cool. Um, there's also a, a configuration now that you can see other party members TP in the party member window in the bottom right. As you can see, I have a thousand TP down there, and if Hayden was a, a useful job, he'd also have some TP. Wow. It turns blue as soon as they have over a thousand and can use weapon skills. Uh, I believe that one's actually a command. What is it? Hang on. Yeah, that is a command you have to enter manually, which is... That one is party... Info, show TP on. Oh, one extra thing that I'll mention again, another little note. Um, if you if you uh, target yourself and do slash check param, all one word, it will list your average item level, your primary accuracy, auxiliary accuracy. Wow, my samurai is a chump. <laughs> Um, accuracy becomes important in the 119 era now because it's a little harder to hit some of the apex mobs and with the sort of soft nature of the level caps and the job points that we mentioned um, there's a lot of like kind of uh, variety in the types of mobs you're fighting and accuracy can really like swing where you might need a, a really high number to, to hit certain monsters or certain in certain events so it's nice to be able to quickly just check yourself and see how you're doing Check your cell. You can also now split the menus out into two menus and <clears throat> divvy up certain filters to go to either left or right. And I think you can also have these above and below each other as well. I've always liked the left and right. Uh, it's yeah. nice for splitting out like conversation and then actual damage and fight related um, logs into, <clears throat> into different logs. So moving on, let's talk about some of the new leveling and uh, objective systems. So we'll kick it off with Records of Eminence. Uh, Records of Eminence is a new system under quests, and it opens up pages and pages of, of objectives that can be activated and then completed. Uh, some of these are, are super simple, like literally, I think this one is uh, talking to a few people. Sometimes it's even less than that. It, it could be 
typing something into chat. Um, they reward you with experience, sparks, and uh, sometimes, is it accolades? Unity accolades? Yep, that's so, correct. So these, um, these are incredibly beneficial. Uh, those sparks become a huge deal. We'll talk about that more in a second. Obviously, the experience gain is, is kind of hamdy. Hamdy. But, um, and the Unity Accolades can be used to fight more difficult Unity monsters and get gear rewards and, and other things of that nature. So, I think the, I think the key thing is the kind of, Sparks can be looked at in a couple of different ways. Um, if you're starting a job out at level 1, or let's say you're coming back to the game and you have like a level, you know, 37 ninja that was a sub-job. You know, I'm a level ninja. Well, because of how the economy's changed, there isn't all that level one through 75 gear on the auction house anymore, um, as or at least not as frequently as there used to be. So they added the spark system. So one way one way you can use those points is to buy gear as you level up through the different Layer. phases. You know, gear for every slot will be available uh, with sparks from the NPC, and it's really cheap. You can just grab it and then toss it. Um, I think in some cases you can even trade some of that gear back for certain rewards, but it's kind of specific. Um, but anyway, yeah. And then if you aren't looking for gear, if you've beyond that, you've gotten to like, let's say 119, the sparks can be used to feed your gill earnings if you want. Um, there's some consu some items like you can buy off the vendors and then sell to an NPC, like any uh, vendor NPC for gill. And there's actually a decent exchange rate. If you do Acheron shields, you can basically convert 10,000 sparks into 100,000 gil by just buying shields and selling them to an NPC. Um, so that's another great way to use sparks. Um, and then you also are going to get from these records of eminence completions, these copper vouchers will be given to you occasionally, which are really nice because you can use those uh, to exchange to the sparks NPC for various items in addition to uh, in-game currency. So you can use, you can get basically any currency from any um, region or part of the game. Like if you need, uh, for example, there's an assault uh, item or some assault requirement you want to do and you need a thousand assault points for a certain assault zone. You can trade some copper vouchers in and get those points. You don't have to go run assault missions by yourself for hours. You can just quickly grab the points. So it kind of a time saver. I try to save up my copper vouchers because the NPC will store them for you. So you can just leave them on there for a rainy day. Yeah, they're really handy if there's some system that you really haven't been engaged with, but for whatever reason, whatever you're working on at that moment, you really need a lot of that system's currency. Um, it's happened to me with Obsidian Fragments. I've used it for, like Hayden just mentioned, the <clears throat> assault points. Um, it just can be very, very valuable. Oh, yeah. So also with Records of Eminence, when you're, like Hunter said, there's a huge variety of things to be done with Records of Eminence that you can start. Most of the things are repeatable um, objectives. Some are one time, like complete a stock story mission. You, you can go in and click that and you'll get credit for it if you've already done it or if you're doing it for the first time, have it flagged. And when you finish the mission, it'll complete. But a lot of stuff is repeatable. Um, especially in the combat region specific uh, menu and within there let's say you're going to go level in an old zillart zone like boyata tree you can go into roe objective list go down to combat region specific go down to zillart one find the boyata tree and it says defeat the requisite number of enemies in the boyata tree number required 10 reward 16 sparks 100 xp and five unity accolades um that's, that's like a super easy one, but this stuff's nice to flag if you're leveling in the Boyata Tree with a low-level job because you kill 10 enemies, you get a little bit of sparks and some some different rewards, um, and it just kind of builds up. If you've ever ex experienced the Survival Guide or Ground, ground Tomes systems, uh, it's similar to that in that you kind of flag this stuff and then it just automatically repeats for you. Yep, you should also always be flagging things like Vanquish multiple enemies, deal 500 damage, deal 1,000 damage. Uh, I think they reset every once in a while, and yeah. you can just kind of keep looping and, and building on it. I always forget to look through to see what kind of, uh, you know, different 
records of eminence uh, I may have available for whatever I'm doing. Definitely check it out. It, it's a really cool system. The sparks are incredibly valuable, and you actually need to use this system to fight and win. Not fight and win, but to gain your rewards from various unity encounters. So yep. definitely check it out. It's pretty cool. The tutorial section is really, really handy. This is a mistake I made. I didn't know about the tutorial section in here. Yep, skipped it entirely. I skipped it entirely, but it's I did, I did the same important. thing. <laughs> um, so if you I, go to intermediate is kind of the, the key one. Basics you can do. Um, it's helpful. I think you may have to complete basics for intermediate to unlock. Um, so achieving level 99 is the first step in intermediate. So this is sort of a later game thing if you're just starting out. But if you're coming back, this is a really great way when you get to 99 to get yourself some like really sweet rewards to just help you on your way to 119. To, yeah, to just kind of handsy stuff. So just do it. It's great. So the Rhapsody's of Vanadil system uh, is the new Final Fantasy XI introduction. It came together a few years ago for kind of pulling together all of these storylines that have existed across multiple expansions, um, the original main city quest lines uh, into this one cohesive Final Fantasy XI story. Uh, along with that, it started introducing amazing rewards that kind of pulled the game into what many would say is 2018 speed um, mm -hmm. and allows for some benefits that are uniquely available only through this this Rhapsody's of Vanity deal. I, I, it, I consider it a, a must-do. The rewards are amazing, and the storyline is actually really cool, so you should definitely get your way through that. Um, this can honestly also be a, a great way to sort of get you moving through the expansions in a way that makes sense. If you're coming back and, and everything just seems like kind of a hodgepodge of, of questing and, and stories just all over the place, this will sort of put it in a nice flow. That kind of makes it just a, a generally a more linear experience than what it may feel like now in 2018. Um, there's a certain stage at which point it considers you far enough through each expansion that you can move on to the next expansion. Uh, it's up to you whether or not you want to continue with the storyline of, of each expansion or kind of take a break and move on to, to the next one to see what kind of progress you made. It'll also work your way, your way up through the levels, starting at kind of the early level 10, 20, 30 uh, city missions, and then by the end, it'll work you up into the Adelin storyline, which is primarily at 99. Uh, at some point, it also introduces you to the Eshka zones, which contain enemies from the mid 40s up through level 99. This can be a great area to level up in uh, or get merits at 99, and there are numerous difficult, notorious monsters to be found here, which drop really valuable gear. Um, you won't be facing them until you're already fairly well geared at level 99. But the point is, Rhapsody is, is super important. It kind of ties together all the systems right now in, in Final Fantasy XI in a cohesive and fun way. It also gives you access to trust, which we'll get into in a, in a second. Yep, and it also, as you complete objectives within Rhapsody's of Anadiel, you're going to unlock key items. And those key items come with a number of different benefits that are pretty extreme. I think the first one, for example grants like a 30 percent uh, experience point gain boost plus like a 30 or 40 percent um skill up um increase so your you'll skill up faster so there's just tons of stuff jam-packed into rhapsodies of vanadiel in terms of getting your character to be to that 2018 sort of <laughs> speed status so it's definitely one of those things you want to try to make some progress in um, right away if you can because it's it's super beneficial um, and the quality of life stuff that it unlocks in terms of how quickly you can level up other jobs and progress uh, is, is definitely worth it plus uh, like Hunter said we're going to talk about trust some more but you can only you can eventually spawn five trusts to fill out your party but you won't have access to all five you can't spawn five until you've completed a certain point in Rhapsodies yeah, and the trust system is pretty fantastic because it allows you to start using NPCs that you've encountered in in stories and, and quests across Van Adeel as as party members to replace uh, different jobs and, and kind of party roles that you may have once filled with, with real people. And, the, you know, you can still invite real people to fill out the rest of your party or, you know, start 
with specific roles that you're you're trying to work with but if nobody's available or you just want to mess around a little bit by yourself uh, you can make all that progress now alone with the trust system so trusts are npcs that you can summon as a new magic function um they're actually under the the they're under a trust menu but if you go into your magic through the main menu that's where kind of trusts pop up uh each trust is uniquely uh different i actually kind of want to just start over how we're talking about trusts hang on let me look at this so trust cannot be spawned until you're level five on any job uh trust each carry a bit of a party role so you can really have a ton of fun building various groups without having to message everyone on the server because you feel like playing a dark or dragoon that day which used to struggle a little bit to gain parties sometimes uh, not all trusts are created equal though each carry unique traits abilities and action sets some are tanks some are white mages focused on not spells versus ga cures some are red mages that cast more nukes than buffs you will find out as you go deeper that there are some really neat and powerful combos but some trusts unfortunately just don't really serve much of a purpose but regardless it's amazing for for leveling they can be pulled into missions they can even be pulled down into the the famous mat fight which is a little depressing to me but they make uh approaching the game a, a lot simpler especially when you're trying to pull together some people for a specific mission that maybe everybody else has already completed as you can see, you can release and summon new trusts and kind of come up with a, a perfect combo that keeps your party moving effectively while also not dying. But as Hayden mentioned earlier, you will not be able to spawn a full party of trusts until you've made a certain amount of progress in Rhapsody's Defended Deal. Uh, there are key items granted as you progress through Rhapsodies that do provide those very large bonuses, one of which is an increase in number of trusts that you can summon. I think the first time you can summon trust after the the quest is complete it's only two but then obviously by by the end um somewhere in between you get access to the remaining two to fill out your whole party there's an initial trust quest line to earn a starting collection by visiting each of the three main cities but after that you'll want to start down the larger list of npcs that you can talk to uh which is probably best found online because the list is huge now it's a cool kind of gotta catch them all system, so keep your eyes out for campaigns that Square Enix introduces that offer up temporary access to certain rare trusts, because not all trusts can be accessed in the game um, at all times. Some are only available at certain times of year or just during those certain campaigns. Vendor Moogle? Um, before we move on from trusts, I do want to just mention the fact that every trust is a job with a sub job. So you can get to know your trusts and start to understand them. For example, M. Choo Choo here is a rune fencer. So he has some really unique abilities that only rune fencers have. Um, and I believe his sub is warrior. So he will provoke and do various things like that. Gilgamesh is a samurai. Fablinks is a thief, I think. Um, so it's really fun because they do carry that party role. And in the, in the trust magic menu, it'll actually show iconography, like tanks are a shield, DDs are a sword, ranged DDs are a, a bow, an arrow, symbol, magic caster DDs, or are like a staff, and then healers are clubs. So it's just cool because you can quickly know what kind of role they fill. And then if you dig into you know BG Wiki, for example, you can start to understand specifically what they'll do, how to trigger them. Some um, trust DDs will respond differently to your weapon skills and create skill chains with you. Some will wait for you to get a hundred or thousand TP to weapon skills. So you can um, basically do various like opening and closing of skill chains and some will magic burst automatically. Some will cure automatically with some others will focus on like debuffs on the mob or or uh, nah spells on players so it's just cool there's so much variety and it's also cool it's just characters from the game that you're playing with so it's a it's a great system it's really a lot of fun one of the cooler introductions um in the more recent versions of the game is actually the curio vendor moogle obviously with a decrease in population many items that were previously available through crafting began to kind of drop off the auction house and become a little bit less available. So they introduced the Curio Vendor Moogle, who, as you progress through, I believe, the Rhapsodies of Anadeal mission, starts providing more and more useful um, items. These can vary from, from key items 
which are literally coffer and chest keys that can be used for for relic and uh, not relic artifact quests um, to more common based items like foods uh, ammo ninja tools everything you can possibly think of now you don't have everything available at at once once you first start doing those quests but the further you progress more and more of his shop um, sort of unlocks uh, it's really helpful and, and a great way to kind of keep some of those consumables uh, available especially in in the lower levels where some of the more common foods from back in the day may may or may not be still available in the auction house yeah so while we're talking about it as for the actual leveling uh, many old camps have been converted uh, as well to accommodate the extra levels from 75 to 99 there's a new amazing guide out there called fantastic xps and where to find them it's a quick look at where you can go for each level range. I'll try to remember to include it in the description below. Most of the old camps still exist, but uh, a few have certainly changed. So I check out the guide if you're work working your way from one to 99 to kind of keep having different ideas of where you might be able to, to progress. And especially post 75, I certainly had no idea where various camps might be available as those were all entirely brand new mobs to me um, to make your way through those levels. So next, we'll talk a little bit about gear um, and how, how it's working now at 99. To start off, you, you can, if you're not doing the, the Records of Eminence or you're not quite there yet with the Records of Eminence tutorial that offers you up some, some free gear, you can grab an eye level 117. Uh, the number just indicates, you know, its general level of strength, 117 being the second highest, available 119 being the highest. <clears throat> um, the Records of Eminence vendors, the Sparks vendors, will sell you I level 117 gear that can kind of just get you rolling with some starter content at level uh, 99. They've added various ways to upgrade old gear, which is super cool. You can upgrade your artifact, your relic, and your Empyrean gear all to 119 status. Artifact and relic can even go to a 119 plus two or plus three version now. This is sort of Scranix's way of giving us the cool old gear and art, um, but refreshed with crazy new stats, new abilities, and really unique modifiers that you don't see anywhere else except for on that job specific armor. Uh, the process for getting the gear from the old version to the 119 version is a little bit tricky. It's different for the artifact, the Relic and the Empyrean, all three have different paths that are semi-similar. The one thread through all the paths that is the same is to go from the old piece of armor, you have to go to the 109 version of the armor first, then you reforge it to the 119 version, and then you can go further from there. But that first jump from the old piece of artifact, Relic or Empyrean to 109, requires a bunch of consumable items. Again, it varies based on if it's the artifact, relic, or Empyrean. But in addition to consumable items, it's chapters. These chapters for going to 109 are chapters 1 through 5. Each chapter number corresponds to one of the five pieces of main armor. Head, hands, legs, and feet. Then when you go from 109 to 119, you need chapters 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. The first set of chapters, one through five, come from doing old school BCNM style battlefields. However, they're upgraded versions that now use not Beastman Seals, but Sacred Kindred Crests as currency to get the orbs that you need to go to these battlefields. They're pretty easy fights. They're, you can do them at around 117, 119 if you take your time and you're careful. You do get more chapters per fight if you increase the difficulty level. That process is fairly straightforward and getting chapters one through five is easy. You can also purchase them for 7,500 sparks of eminence from a vendor if you choose, or if let's say you have, uh, maybe you only need one more chapter to do that upgrade. It might just be better to go ahead and buy the one from the vendor instead of doing a whole nother fight run. Now to get chapters six through 10, again, for going from 109 to 119, you have to do a different series of battles. It's the avatar fights which are super fun, but they can be very challenging. They drop fewer chapters per fight and they do take longer to farm, but it is well worth it because all the artifact, relic, and Empyrean gear for all the jobs is absolutely incredible, super cool, and just looks amazing. Um, relic and artifact have very similar paths. 
but Empyrean is very different, and I just want to make a note of this. I made the mistake when I came back to the game as my Dark Knight. I had gained all the Empyrean gear and the Abyssa content before I quit. Come back, and I was like, yeah, I'm totally getting 119 Empyrean Dark Knight armor. Sweet. Went out, upgraded it all from the old version to 109, did all that farming for the chapter 1 through 5s and all the items I needed, got it all to 109. I was like, all right, here we go, pushing it to 119, and couldn't. I had no way to get it. I was like, why can't I get it to 119? So it turns out you have to ve defeat you have to defeat the Vagari bosses. There are five of them. You have to defeat all five if you want to unlock the ability to upgrade all five pieces of armor. You can defeat them one at a time, and each slot will unlock the corresponding piece of armor. So if you only beat one of the five bosses, whatever armor slot he unlocks will be granted to you as an upgrade path. But it does require um, if you want to get all five pieces, you have to beat all five bosses. Square Enix did actually, in the most recent update in October, change that how slightly. You no longer have to do a full Vagari run to beat the bosses. You can now do just the boss fights, but you have to be fairly deep. And by fairly deep, I mean pretty much done with the Adeline story mission to get access to the area where you would enter those arenas. Um, but it is nice that they've added a boss-only run that takes one to six players, because previously to get into Vagari, you needed at least three players at a minimum um, to even have a shot at doing that run and it was very time consuming tricky and difficult but it's nice now you can go with the group and just beat the bosses point being overall it's really cool that you can upgrade the old armor because i love the way all the artifact relic and empyrean looks and they carry some great stats um but again you kind of have to approach the gear if you're coming back and say your character is level 75 or if you're coming back and if you're starting out for the first time you want to try to get your way to like 99 first I would recommend then getting, you know, you can buy some Sparks gear that gets you to 170. You can start doing some of those um, Beastman Seal upgrade fights and then build up your gear set from there um, and just kind of take it in stages. It'll, it's going to be hard to jump in and try to get your artifact right to 119. It's it, it's fun, but it's, or it's just a little challenging, but it's totally worth it. So, so definitely look into that system. BG Wiki has an incredible... Um, table for every stage for every type of armor so and for every job obviously so just look there for all the different items you need uh, the huge takeaway is that the artifact and relic upgrade systems the artifact is a little bit cheaper um the, the relic usually has some unique effects and the empyrean while the hardest has some crazy unique statuses that really are only obtained through that but are the most difficult to upgrade because of the extra vagari um kind of checkpoint that has to be made the first thing i did when i came back to try to get it to 119 was to do that art artifact and relic upgrade um thinking it was going to be the fastest way for me to get 119 with some amazing gear the artifact and relic isn't always the absolute best piece available though so i highly recommend you also check out the ambuscade system uh, the ambuscade system changes every month uh, has some pretty uh, solid gear and they're all upgradable too so even if you get some of the lower tiered gear you can work to improve it and some of the improved gear is still some of the better gear that you can get at 119 uh, for a while uh, it's better to do in groups uh, the more real people i should say that you have uh, available the easier some of these fights are going to be but you can also work on a solo if, if that's your preference or that's you know the option that you have available you can change the difficulty level. There are two tiers of the ambuscade fights. Uh, the <laughs> not impressive. What's what's the harder one called? Uh, there's intense yeah. ambuscade intense. and then regular ambuscade. <laughs> the regular is much easier, and you can uh, change both the the level that you're facing. Is it the very easy? Yeah, it's it's very easy, easy, normal, hard, very hard uh, system. You can kind of try it out, see sort of what tier. You're capable of beating uh, each month. Uh, the jobs that are, are better for each fight kind of change by month and, and by objective. Sometimes you get lucky and it's something that you're really, really capable and, and sort of geared towards beating as whatever job you're currently playing. Other months you just kind of get unlucky, but usually you can sort of downgrade the difficulty to a tier that, that you're capable of progressing through. Uh, this all drops the, if, if you're in a Returning player, the Limbus and, and Salvage gear, uh, visually anyway, they upgraded to new 119 variants of, of stats. 
They have changed around a little bit what jobs can equip them. Um, some of the stranger ones are that Red Mage can now use Homem Gear, which is very cool, but also very strange. Um, but seriously, some of this gear is, is some of the best starting 119 gear you can get, and, and many pieces can last you even longer than that. I highly re recommend it as a, a starting point for anybody just getting back or just getting into the game uh, at, at level 99. It certainly is a little bit easier to approach than some of the artifact upgrades, although I do encourage that as well because, like Hayden said, the gear looks amazing, and many of it is uniquely special um, for whatever job you happen to be leveling. Um, some of the other events that are available to do if you get up to, let's say, 119 and you're feeling good about the game and you're really investing a lot of time, you may want to start thinking about additional ways to get gear um, or just have fun. There's, of course, the old school Dynamis that can be still useful, especially if you want to go on the long path towards making a relic weapon. It's it's doable now <laughs> compared to what it used to be, but it does still take quite a while of farming away in Dynamis if you choose to go through that method. And you can look in BG Wiki at all the changes made to Dynamis because they are extensive. Um, but that system does exist. Uh, Delve is an Adeline specific uh, event. It's pretty fun. It needs, I believe, three people to enter, um, but it can uh, deliver on some pretty good sellable items and also some gear. Uh, the Unity NM system is a great one. We discussed it a little bit earlier. Basically, you flag a Unity NM in your uh, Records of Eminence log, and then you can go right to one of the Unity NPCs, and they actually have an option when you talk to them that says travel to one of my target areas, or I forget what the exact phrase is, but you basically travel to, you can travel to any of the places you have flagged on your list or any that you don't, and you'll be near a ethereal junction, and you click on that, the NM will spawn, and upon killing it, it will drop a coffer into your inventory, and it will actually drop a coffer into any player's inventory that's in, in your party upon killing the, the NM. What's really neat about these Unity NMs is they're all reprisals of the old school Final Fantasy XI NMs that we know and love. Things like Leaping Lizzie, um, for example, there's a new version of Leaping Lizzie that <laughs> drops a new version <laughs> of the Leaping Boots. Um, and all the gear they drop is really cool and unique because it's the old gear you know and love. Um, and it's all 119. Like, for example, the, the Sobero weapon for Samurai that was so cool because it occasionally attacked two to three times. There's a new 119 version of that. None of the Unity gear is like earth shatteringly amazing. A lot of it is really good and is best in slot for for a lot of jobs in terms I was of gonna say, you haven't seen these hysteria bits plus one. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's there's a lot of it that is best in slot for for jobs. There's some of it that's not so great, but it is all 119. It is all a ton of fun and it's a super quick, easy to get going on system. It does get very very hard if you do the higher level. Like you can get up to one level 135 unity fights. They're very difficult and require a big group. But there's stuff as low as 119 that you could go out and do and, and have a lot of fun with. Uh, they also run campaigns occasionally where it'll drop double coffers. So if you catch one of those, it's a great time to try to farm out one of those uh, pieces of gear that you want. Um, also, Omen, we mentioned earlier the artifact uh, plus two and plus three versions. That Those, are, those upgrade paths are uh, fed with consumable items dropped in Omen, which is a new end game event that came along with the rap cities of Vana dl expansion so when you complete rap cities of Vana dl you can then enter omen um it's a fun time it's a very unique system again i'd recommend just reading about it if you're interested but it's what enables the upgrading for the artifact plus two and plus three um dynamis divergence is different from dynamis it's a whole new system it's actually the most it's the newest system that square Enix has added to the game um i personally haven't participated in it but this is how you get your relic gear to plus two and plus three. So it's sort of parallels Omen in that way. But it, it offers um, the same old original kind of dynamics experience where um, you have to kind of farm through with a big group. Uh, it drops consumable items that you trade to this goblin NPC to eventually upgrade your relic gear from 119 plus one version to a plus two and eventually plus three version if you choose. And that gear is really powerful. Um, but it is very, very expensive if you don't have a group to go with to buy those items you need off the auction house. Um, so just keep that in mind. Gaius Fate came along with Rhapsodies of Anadiel as well as Omen. Um, this is an event that takes place within the zones. 
and it's really great for farming up some cool gear and fighting some fun NMs. I know Hunter mentioned it earlier, but we've had a lot of fun with those NMs. And within those Esha zones, there are there's like a status effect that you get when you enter automatically, and you can enhance that status effect over time by each NM you kill. When you get that kill, you'll be able to go back to the NPC and add to your list some bonus like accuracy and attack enhanced or evasion enhanced or magic damage enhanced um you basically tag those every time you kill a, a different uh, zone nm you're able to upgrade that enhancement effect so over time by killing those you sort of make yourself stronger when you're in any esha zone and finally sinister rain that is an end game fight from uh, seekers of adelin and it is really fun i think they recently made some changes to it um but it grants some pretty cool rewards as well. So those are some other events to consider if you uh, got into 119 and you're feeling like you want to explore some different different areas. I oh, I just have I have two top tips. I've I forgot two top, top tips. Top tips. Two top, top Hayden, Hayden tips. Hayden top tips. All right, number one, there's a goblin in every city who you can go to once a day. So if you're in Eastern Time in North America, it resets at 11 a.m. Um, that you can talk to him again. And I don't know what, where he's at in all the cities, but he's, he's, I think he's in, he's in most of the cities somewhere. Yeah. Um, but he's a treasure goblin. Hey, I'm going to head to lower, I'm heading to lower Juno now. I'm all right. Work. I'm at the Adelin one, but you, you talk, you can talk to him once a day. Um, you can pretty much ignore all the stuff in his list. You, you can click on him. You say, open the box and profit. And you go down to special dial 50 tally just, but just do the special dial every day. I've gotten like multiple three and four million gill items out of this thing. Occasionally I just get nothing like goblin mush pot, but basically this, this daily box has the ability to grant you any item in the game. Essentially. I think the list is, is pretty much any item in the game. So you can get anything from a, a ch chunk of chunk rock of, salt, chunk of tin ore that I just got. Nice. I got the attestation of invulnerability. Wow. I don't know what that is. I don't. That's probably the most probably rare probably in the game. Mil. Probably four mil. <laughs> or you um, get some moat carp. Or you get some moat carp. But I carp. have also gotten like a one nineteen. I got the uh, the the one nineteen version of the Sroko Kukri, an amazing level seventy five dagger. Oh yeah. Uh, that just came out of this this little box one day so definitely try to remember to do it every day that you're online it's, it's totally worth it oh uh, yeah and last thing this isn't really a tip this is just a, a notification for anybody returning to the game all the auction houses are now collated into one there is no longer a separate auction house for juno and the cities etc it is all just one system so you can sell and buy things from any auction house anywhere um and it's all the same stuff Final Fantasy XI in 2018 is, is incredibly different than it has been in its past 16 years, but I, I certainly still think it's it's worth your time. It's still an amazing game. Everything that I, I loved about it back in 2004 is, is still here, even though it's just kind of presented in a different way. It's far more approachable, so if the issue was ever that you didn't have time or you couldn't pull together enough people or it just took... You know, too long to get places in Final Fantasy XI. I totally understand, and the game has certainly changed enough that that shouldn't be stopping you from from exploring it now. Uh, it's definitely worth it. I've had an amazing time revisiting this for the past couple of years. I highly encourage it. Uh, please, in the comments below, ask any questions that that you feel you may have. I, I highly encourage you to check out the BG Wiki site. Um, they have an amazing collection of community. Uh, gathered and created guides, uh, tips, descriptions of, of anything from quests to monsters to items to whole systems. Uh, I would not have made it this far without BG Wiki. Everything we've discussed today is only the bare minimum information about those systems. I highly encourage you to then go to BG Wiki to look at them uh, in more detail to really get um, all the details answered about how everything kind of comes together. Thanks to Hayden for coming out to this uh, special edition of Final Fantasy XI How-Tos, uh, how to return to Final Fantasy XI and, and guides for new players. Yeah, absolutely happy to help. If you want to play with us, though, you're more than welcome to. we got a, a link shell that's 
growing a little bit here and there. Um, you're welcome to join. Uh, we're on Odin server, so if you want a world pass or anything, just let Hunter know or whatever, and we can we can work it out. Yeah, please reach out. Uh, and as I said, leave in the comments below whatever any questions you might have. Uh, question of the day, what is the longest time you've been away from any MMO and then still returned? And was that return a good time? I hope if it's Final Fantasy XI, the answer is about to be right now and that uh, it's an amazing time, but I highly encourage it. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you all in the next one. Peace. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in more videos like this, think about subscribing. And if you already have, don't forget to click that little bell next to the sub button to get notified when new videos go live. Hit me up in the comments with your thoughts on this video, or come hang out and chat with me on Twitch every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And definitely look me up on Twitter or Instagram and hunt for games to keep up with what else I've got going on. See ya.